Okay. We are the civil group of the Mohandas Organization of Iranian Canadian Engineers and Architects. We are located at Toronto, Ontario, and uh, we are composed of a group of engineers that strive for greatness and professional and cultural uh, betterment of themselves and their colleagues. We have uh, technical gatherings, we have cultural gatherings, we have a lot of activities going on. Anybody interested can check our website at mohandes.com. And uh, tonight, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Uh, Tarek Al Kedri with us. He has a PhD in civil engineering from University of Missouri Rolla, and he has over 24 years of experience in structural repair and rehabilitation of concrete structures. And uh, he is a member of several very well known professional uh, communities like American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE. American Concrete Institute, ACI, International Concrete Repair Institute, ICRI, American Water Work Association, AWWA. I see the list of achievements and uh, papers and uh, uh, very impressive work that he has done, but uh, I stop here and ask Dr. Tarek al Khedaji, to please begin your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Afshin. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me and having me here doing a presentation on strengthening of concrete structures with FRP composites. Um, again, like uh, Afshin mentioned, my, um, my name is Tarek al Kardaji, and I manage an engineering group that is focused on developing solutions for repair and strengthening of structures, and mainly concrete structures. Um, concrete, you know, is my passion, uh, you can say. I've been doing this for 20-some years, um, actually more, much more than that. 25 years I've been focused on repair uh, of concrete structures. Um, it's an interesting field because it's, you have to deal with existing structures, with existing conditions and loading, and you have to account for all these conditions and loading and existing deformation, stress conditions when you design a strengthening solutions. Um, so today the presentation will be focused on one of the techniques that we use for upgrading concrete uh, structures, and that is using fiber reinforced polymers or as, as to commonly referred to FRP. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the type of these materials, how they're applied, how they're used in analysis. I'm gonna show you some of these applications so you get an idea how this is used in the, in the field. And when I started 20 years ago, where there was almost no codes on sta or standards, we worked with several committees, ACI, which is the American Concrete Institutes, uh, Canadian Standards, to develop these uh, FRP uh, standards. And now we have guidelines in the US, in Canada, in New Zealand, in China, in Japan, everywhere. Um, so it's not really a new technology. It's a, a mainstream technology that's used worldwide. Um, I can tell you just myself, I was involved in a project um, that included at least 3 million square feet of, uh, of carbon uh, fiber enforcement. Uh, close to 100 plus projects. Um, um, and those are both in uh, mainly in North America and the US and Canada, but we also have some a project in the in the Middle East, uh, including uh, mainly through our office. By. And I'm going to show you some of these case studies. Um, so let's start. Um, well, first, why we do strengthening and repair of structures, right? There are many reasons why we do repair and strengthening. One of them is that concrete structures, you know, and concrete materials are relatively durable, where you have really steel encapsulated in concrete. 
But we know there are many reasons why concrete and steel start degrading. Um, part of it related to inadequate design of the material itself, like the concrete, or could be exposure to aggressive environments, inadequate maintenance of structures. Um, and of course, like we know, with, when we come to use like uh, chlorides and the icing salts, and, and when you have structures in marine environments, you know, the chloride can get into the concrete, cause corrosion, and that's in turn lead to spoiling of the concrete, loss of section capacity of the steel, and that's reduced the capacity. There are some cases where you can do strengthening and sometimes like the structure you see on the screen, it's very, really impractical to do any repair and strengthening because you have sometime uh, fully contaminated concrete with, with the chlorides that it's hard to extract or prevent for the corrosion from happening again. Other cases is sometime we have environmental, like when we design structures, you know, we design them in a simple model, simply supported, et cetera. Um, but sometimes these, these structures, we know they have to move, right? Sometimes due to temperature change and all these supports member, they have to start, you know, um, um, slide a little bit to, uh, to account or to take all these forces and stresses from thermal uh, uh, changes. Um, structures may not behave either the way we design them as a result. For example, if you look at the photo on the left, where you have an element supported on a, um, on a uh, inverted uh, uh, beam, uh, the, the, the support may freeze and that creates friction. Friction reduces the shear capacity and you end up with some cracks. And in other cases, you know, many cases we've seen collapse of structures actually, or partial collapse because some of these traces are so high then can cause failure. The photo to the bottom right, it's maybe you cannot see it very well, but there's a crack almost at the edge of the scoreboard, which really would combine with corrosion and high movement, you know, in the, there's a very high potential for failure. And this project, actually, there was one failure of one of the corbels. Other things is, is renovation and upgrade of the structure. I mean, there's a, a limited number of space, you know, right now you go to Toronto, for example, or New York or any of these big cities. Uh, there is no more space to build new structures. So owners may try to take over old structures and renovate them and repurpose them and, and, and reuse them. And when you do that, sometimes you have to renovate. That's when you have to cut openings in slab. You may need to cut to cut, you know, to pass new uh, conduits. This, the photo to the bottom right is basically a slab where they need to add restaurant on the top side. They start rolling it through the slab. So all these changes most of the time can damage existing reinforcements, change the behavior of the structure and may require you know, new load path or upgrade of the structure. The photo to the left, you see the big one, this entire opening is actually was cut into the slab and this is a post tension slab. You can see you know, the edge of the slab, you can see these dots, it's basically anchor location where the PT was anchored before you know, the opening was cut. So, some of these changes in the, in the loads and the load path can acquire additional reinforcement uh, and that can be done with carbon fiber. Um, other uh, reason why we've been using carbon fiber a lot is for lateral loads, um, you know, when it comes to seismic load, wind load, etc. the lateral load resistant system may be have, you know, inadequate capacity. You may need to increase the strength of existing shear walls, or sometimes you need to wrap existing column to increase the ductility to account for drift. These things can easily be done with carbon fiber and I'm gonna show you some examples for these applications. And you know, I mentioned there are many different techniques that we can use for strengthening of structures. Some of the most common one is the top uh, left is basically using section enlargement. That's basically uh, doweling in steel reinforcement in both direction. Uh, chipping the surface to roughen it, then forming and pumping concrete and filling the, the void. And basically you're, you're beefing up the section by adding more concrete, more steel. By doing that, we add more strength, more bending capacity, more shear capacity, more stiffness. Um, so this is very common. One of the oldest techniques we've been using for you know, probably 80, 80, 90 years. Um, other techniques like span shortening or adding steel supports, you know, basically bring in steel elements and add them under the structure to take some of that load of overstressed elements and redistribute them and create a new load path. Um, it's a common technique, not always desired because it's really changed the aesthetics of the structure and sometimes take from the headroom, but still 
can be used when there is uh, a good um, space that where you can fit these elements. And then the third technique is external post tensioning, where we use high strength steel cables and, and basically pre profile them along the elements, like you see in this photo a beam with the post tensioning anchored high points and low point at mid span that goes high point on top of the column. By reprofiling the post tensioning, when you stress it, you can create some kind of uplift force that overcome um, additional loads that you may add to the structure or deficiency in the existing structure elements. So this technique been used a lot and we still use it within the repair and strengthening industry. And then the fourth technique, which is most common as well, is adding steel plates. So basically if I'm missing or don't have adequate internal steel rebar reinforcement, I can add external steel plates, glue them with epoxy, put mechanical anchors and utilize them to add more capacity to the elements. So these are the typical techniques we've been using for many years. And you know, approximately 25, 30 years ago, civil engineers start thinking, hey, I mean, we're, we're ultimately trying to add more tension capacity and we're using all the steel, all of the steel. Why can't we use some other material that may not corrode or cannot corrode like carbon fiber, glass fiber, the aerospace industry, the defense industry have been using these composites for 70, 80 years now uh, to create components and pieces, you know, for airplanes, ships, boats, et cetera. Why not utilize them in civil application? And then we start thinking, okay, let's start doing the test. And several universities um, uh, pioneered uh, this, um, this technique. Uh, Japan started this actually because they were looking for method to improve structures in a simple way. And that's where we start using carbon fiber and glass fiber. And we start, you know, utilize them to increase the shear capacity of walls by adding them horizontally, similar to horizontal steel bars or wrapping around columns to increase their shear capacity or ductility under seismic load and also increase the axial capacity by, by confining the section. We start wrapping beams and joists with FRP to create additional shear reinforcement similar to the internal stirrups. You have external reinforcement that would bridge and prevent shear cracking. And then on slab, you can see it applied on the top side or the bottom side to you know, provide bending capacity, negative bending, positive bending capacity as needed. Nice thing about these materials that they are relatively thin profile. Uh, we're talking about one to two to three millimeters thickness max. It depends on which product you're looking at, but they are much stronger than steel. We're talking about a material that's really the composite that are approximately three to four times and even sometimes six times stronger than steel. So you can get very high strength within that simple pro profile. Um, and because they are simple, they don't change the geometry, they can be easily hidden and therefore doesn't change a lot the, uh, uh, the shape of the existing structural elements. So here you can see FRP attached to the underside of a slab to increase the, what we call it, you know, positive bending uh, at the underside. And then you can see here FRP applied on the top side in two directions around the column. So basically increasing the column strip bending capacity in, in two uh, uh, directions. Um, we've been using it a lot. I mean, I tell you there's no day that we don't have a project where we're putting FRP around a small openings and penetrations uh, where basically you are cutting a small opening to allow for a duct or a conduit or a pipe through the slab. And by doing this, you're cutting some existing steel. So FRP can be added around the penetration to prevent, to prevent stress concentration and propagation of let's say 45 degree, if you imagine cracks from these corners which you know, most of the time when we build new, construct, new construction, we have an opening, we put reinforcement around these openings. So we are post installing reinforcement using carbon fiber to mimic the requirement of the new construction that we typically use in new design. Here you can see a case where there's, uh, you know, the entire slab has been strengthened. So you're using strips on the underside of the slab for positive bending. And this is, you can tell that's a one-way slab between beams. And here you can see that there's basically a strip on the bottom to add flexural capacity and additional shear, uh, shear reinforcement to add shear capacity toward the end. And we know that when it comes to a beam element, the maximum shear is toward the end. So you can see that's where apparently the designer in this case determined that the FRP is, is needed. 
And here's a column confinement. I mentioned that. The nice thing about confinement, we'll talk about it a little bit more details, is you can not only increase the ductility and shear strength, but also the axial capacity. Because by holding the section together, you can increase its axial load uh, capacity. So sometime in construction, you are designing a column and you specify, let's say, 40 MPA, and, and then you, you, you know they do a cork test or cylinder test, and they tell you, oh, it's only 24, it's only 25, and we need 30. You know, so carbon fiber may be utilized to wrap the column and add that difference and restore the capacity of the column. And these things happen a lot in new construction where, uh, you know, sometime you, 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 you need to increase the capacity. You call an you know, engineer who works with the composites can design the strengthening elements. And here you can see this is lateral system. This is, um, this is a building, but this is not seismic. This is actually lateral loads um, coming from wind. This is, I remember this building was in Florida. So they found there's a shear wall. That shear wall has some flexural deficiency and some shear deficiency at two levels. Uh, so carbon fiber was you know, applied externally to the wall to add the uh, capacity that's, that's needed. And, and meet the, the code requirements. Nice thing about FRP, you know, in this case, it's applied externally, would not affect the interior um, of the building. However, this building was still going under construction, so it was, you know, was not hard to do this. And finally, pipes. Uh, we've actually been using carbon fiber also in strengthening of um, existing uh, high pressure pipes. Um, these are called PCCP. A pre-stressed concrete so, uh, cylindrical pipe. <clears throat> they are they go anywhere from one meter to three four meter in diameter. They they run in, in many kilometers actually thousands of kilometers below cities and towns, and they used to move in um, um, potable water. Um, these been in service for 30, 40, 50 years, falling apart. So carbon fiber is used and by applying it layer by layer. Inside a pipe, you can build a pipe within the existing pipe that's made of composite to take the entire pressure and be stand alone. Um, and believe it or not, you know, most of the time replacing these is very expensive because digging through roads and next to hospitals and schools, it's not something easy. So although composites are not very cheap, the option is still considered economical and practical. Um, in terms of application, I mean, if, if you think about all these application I just described to you, it's all depend on this high strength material bonded well to the concrete substrate. Therefore, it's very important to bond the material to a good concrete, it's not really concrete that's been exposed to the weather and it's been contaminated and has been painted or has on it material that come maybe from the um, uh, uh, foam release agent that they use sometime when they do foam work, et cetera. And sometimes you see, you know, when you place concrete, there's a bleed water and loose material that come into the surface. So you try to get rid of all this outer layer of concrete before um, you install the FRP. That can be done by abrasive blasting, uh, such as sand blasting or hydro blasting. Um, Grinding has also been used a lot, especially in for interior application inside buildings, where you basically grind and there's a special cup, a grinding cup to make sure that the surface is cleaned, you remove a layer and make it still keep it rough to some degree. You don't want to create a very smooth surface. What we're trying to get is we're trying to open the pores of the concrete so that when we put epoxy, it will basically penetrate through these pores and that will allow us to get maximum bond to the substrate. So this is the surface of the concrete. And you know, any concrete, doesn't matter how good it looks, once you sand it or sandblast it, it's gonna end up like this. You can find all kinds of micro cracks that you don't see by eye, typically. Um, and what is normal, right? Because we design reinforced concrete as an example in which you know the, the steel reinforcement not gonna be engaged in tension until it gets some micro cracks in the concrete as part of the behavior we designed for. The surface roughness we try to target when we install FRP is referred to CSP3, surface uh, concrete surface profile number three. This is a classification developed by the ICRI, International Concrete Repair Institute. And you know, this is give us an idea by having a number for quality control, what is the minimum surface and inspector can verify it before the FRP is installed. Once you do the, sort of the grinding and open the pores of the concrete, you can see this pier, for example, is a bridge pier. It looked normal, but once you grind it, you can see all these bug holes and micro cracks. First step in installing FRP 
is to first use a layer of epoxy that is very flowable. It's almost like water consistency. The idea is to get this first layer that will in, you know, penetrate into the concrete, get absorbed by the concrete, and that would stiffen and strengthen the outer layer of the concrete. Then we use a next layer, which is a thicker epoxy. It's almost like peanut butter consistency. Its objective is to fill these bug holes and deformations and create a smooth surface for the concrete because we want it to the, you know, the get perfect bond, fully bond into the, the concrete. So this allows us full penetration of the, um, of the surface. Next step, you bring in the carbon fiber, which come in rolls and different width, 300 millimeters, 600 millimeters, depend on the product. You put in a saturator machine and that saturator has in it a resin, really epoxy bath. So the fabric gets into that epoxy bath and there are a couple of uh, several rollers that you know, roll in and push the epoxy into the fabric. And the idea is we wanna make sure it's fully saturated with epoxy so it doesn't have any dry spots or dry pockets within the fiber itself because that's to prevent you know with the, the forces from transferring within the the fab fiber itself so these fibers are continuous long fibers of carbon continuous they're, they're creating like a micro rebar and you encapsulate that into that epoxy to create that composite that is glued into the the concrete once you bring that saturated fabric, you attach it to the surface, you make sure you have no voids behind it, you know, move all the voids. And once it's cured, you can apply it to the coating and could be, you know, anything really. There's a lot of different coatings that are compatible with FRP because once, it, once it's cured, it's really like hard polymer. So you can apply acrylic base um, um, a system uh, or any other system, stucco, cementitious material even can be applied to it with any color. So it's very easily to, to hide. And this is one pier where it was strengthened, two piers actually on a bridge that were strengthened with carbon fiber. And in this case, um, I don't have it in here, but we the FRP was put wrapping around it for shear, was applied on the, on the bottom side for positive bending and was applied on the top side on both sides of the bearing path to provide some negative bending uh, capacity. And the reason why se they selected the Department of Transportation selected the FRP because it's hard to see, but there's a train line next to the pier and they did not want it to use foam work or shoring or concrete next to a train line. While with FRP, you can easily, before the train come, you get everybody off the scaffolding, the workers move them to the side until the train pass, and then you can go back to work. Um, another technique beside this fabric that I described to you, what we call is near surface mounted uh, FRP bars or, or surface embedded FRP bars. And this technique depends on rather than bonding the, the fabric, carbon fabric to the surface, we cut a groove into the surface and epoxy in carbon bars. These are round bars that come in different sizes. The most common ones that we use for uh, strengthening application are equivalent to T10 and T12 in terms of diameter, right? Of course, they have different properties, but only equivalent diameter. In the US, they call them number three and number four bars, and the three eight and four eight, uh, which is half an inch uh, bars. And um, that's in carbon. In glass, there are all different sizes available currently. There are many projects done uh, with, with FRP bars as internal reinforcement in the US and in Canada and many other countries. Uh, right now. So it's really more common to see carbon bars of any size for construction. The way we install these bars, the surface mounted bars, we cut grooves into the surface. So the grooves are typically 18 by 18 millimeters. You cut these grooves, you clean them, and then you epoxy in the bar. And if you think about it, you know, 18 by 18 is less in depth than most of the covers, you know, for any element that we use, slabs, beams, etc. Uh, columns so that it can easily be hidden within, within the uh, concrete cover. However, as, a, as a always, as part of the installation step, you always should use GPR to locate the bars and verify the depth of the steel bars just in case, because there are many cases I can tell you where the actual depth of the cover is less than what it was designed or specified on construction drawings, and these things happen. Cutting, there are many ways that you can use like handheld uh, uh, wall chaser. It's the same like saw that's used to 
uh, repoint masonry where you can uh, take out some, some of the cementitious material and put new grouts. Or sometimes there's also walk behind saw. So there are many techniques can be used to cut these grooves. You can see in here, one tech, this is like the workers, what they've done, they put uh, you know, some tape on both sides, like you paint exactly, put the bar with epoxy. And once they're done, they pull the tapes to make sure it's nice and clean edges. And this is the bar after it's done. You can see it's still a little bit shiny to the, on the photo on the left, mainly because it still did not cure. And to the right, it's hard to see, it's fully cured. You can see bars actually installed in two direction. I know a little bit harder to see on the photo, but they're actually showing bars on all four sides of the columns in two directions. Here you can see this is a bridge deck, actually a highway bridge where the bars were installed uh, on top of an existing steel beam to increase the bending capacity of the slab. So you can see there seems to be a beam in here, a beam in here, and the bars are centered on top of that steel beam to add capacity. Uh, for the for the bridge deck and this they did this thing the the workers before they came back and applied the asphalt like coat of asphalt that covered uh, the entire deck and and uh, provided additional protection from traffic. Um, so many ways these systems come in different shapes and forms and I described in general the concept which is they come in fabric that are in rolls with different length and width. Carbon fabric, glass fabric can be unidirectional, but also we have bidirectional with, F, with the fiber runs in two direction or in plus minus 45 degree pattern. And then the bars that you see the carbon bars, there are also plates, carbon plates that are basically in which the fiber and the resin are impregnated at the factory and they come in plates similar to steel plates. They come in just long, uh, um, long strips, you cut them to length and you glue them to the underside of the slabs. Everything is attached, of course, with epoxy. And finally, we have a new thing that's been using the five, this, uh, seven, eight years called, we call FRP anchors that work with the fabric in which you can use these bundles of fiber like anchors where you drill in, saturated with epoxy, insert them into the the hole, just like a post-installed adhesive anchor, and then splay the ends, the other half that you see in here on the surface to create that anchorage for the, for the FRP. So this is an example for that, how you use that anchor where basically I wanna anchor the end of the sheet, I would drill and basically insert the half of it and the other half would be splayed and that would be providing the full development of the sheets. And we have criteria now for the design of the anchor, how many diameter embedment, similar to adhesive anchors. And, and the other thing that can be used bundles that we refer to as FRP cords, in which, for example, you're doing a, a strut or maybe a diaphragm strengthening in a slab and you need the FRP strengthening and you have a wall in the way, you can drill through that wall, extend this fabric, and then anchor it on both sides. And this way you can achieve a full continuous path. And again, the number and of these bundles that you can use, it depend on the amount of the FRP. And finally, one question I get all the time is related to fireproofing. I mean, this is an external reinforcement applied to the structure. Um, so sometime it depends on how much I'm adding capacity. I may need to provide fireproofing because I'm adding amount, a significant amount of capacity. And for that, there is uh, um, uh, systems that have been tested with each of these FRP systems. The one uh, I work with, the VRAP has a, a fireproofing system. It's approved ULUS and UL Canada listed, both, both countries. Um, and and sp sp spray applied, it's cementitious based vermiculite. You spray it just like the spray applied fireproofing on top of the FRP. And by doing that, you can provide the additional fire rating required. And, and these systems provide up to uh, four hours of fire rating for FRP. Uh, design principles for the, for the engineers to, to understand this. Of course, the design principles are the same. It's all based on mechanics of materials, right? And force equilibrium concept that we use in civil engineers, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. Um, the only different when it comes to design is sometimes the standards from country to country may be different because, you know, there are always when it comes to concrete, it's based on a lot of empirical equation based on science, but really rounded with some factors. So some of these factors and limitation may be different from standard to standard. 
Um, I'm going to describe some of these when I go through principles. I'm going to reference some of the Canadian standards for the FRP specifically, but I can also point out some differences when there's some when, you know, compared to the uh, American uh, standard, which is the ACI. So CS, uh, CSA versus the uh, ACI um, um, guides and uh, standards. So, uh, so in the US, they, they use ACI for 40.2R. And the latest or the current draft is the 17. There's a new document, I think, coming out. I was uh, it's recently at the American Concrete Institute Convention coming out in 22. Um, and beyond that, there's another document which is more like a code than a, co than a guide that is coming actually shortly after that. Um, in Canada, the document that deals with uh, FRP is, uh, is the CSAS 806. This document was published in 12 and then re-approved and published in 2017. So again, some of these stuff that and design requirement I'm going to reference moving forward is related to uh, the S806 uh, documents. So keep that in mind. Okay, so let's say you want to come to the concept. One important thing about carbon fiber is it's a little bit different than, than steel bars because they, carbon fiber or glass fiber, they don't have the elastic plastic behavior where you get really linear elastic and then achieve yielding where the force become constant. Um, if I compare that to, for example, post tensioning cable, you know, I get a very high strength, much higher strength than steel bar, right? Um, close to 18, 1900 uh, MPA. But then after that, I get, you know, some, some ductility. It's like pseudo ductility because this can go up sometime, the, the branch uh, after yielding. If I look now at carbon, you can see it here the line in black, it's linear elastic. It's, you can see the slope of the line represent the stiffness of the material, modulus of elasticity. And you can see it in here, it's almost as stiff. This is carbon fiber. This is the fiber, not the composite. It's as stiff as steel. And sometimes we have products that are actually one and a half stiffer than steel, but they are linear elastic and they can go all the way to failure and the they snap. So they don't have this yield behavior, which means that's going to change how I calculate some of the uh, strength of the material. The glass is much lower strength than carbon, um, maybe one and a half to two times stronger than, than steel, but the stiffness is almost one third that of, of steel. So that's why you can see because of the high strength and high stiffness that we see majority of the application for strengthening applications are done with carbon. Glass is more used for, you know, like masonry and, and brick or, or for some protection. Um, test method, there are standards that met, test method currently STM for all the properties of the FRP. So the manufacturers of all these fabrics and materials, they list their, their mechanical properties, tensile strength, tensile modulus, elongation, compressive strength, et cetera. They're all listed. And on top of that, there are requirements also for durability testing. So these materials, as the way to determine the properties is also you have to expose them into aggressive environment. Like you can see in here, water resistance, salt water, alkali resistance, dry heat resistance, with, with the guidance about the condition, the concentration, or the temperature for the testing. The idea is we're trying to forecast the future strength of this material. So it's something we don't do with typical design, right? We don't account, for example, corrosion rate and reduce our section when we design reinforced concrete. With FRP, we're trying to see, okay, if I leave this in an aggressive environment, where the strength is going to be in 20 or 30 years, and I'm going to design for that. So it's really an advancement in the approach of the design that we use compared to conventional uh, reinforced concrete. So now I know the material properties, for example, tensile properties, compressive properties. I want to design with, with FRP. One thing that's common in most of the standards is that you cannot just design FRP for any capacity. Um, you have to uh, first make sure that there is a strength increase that is limited, not really excessive. How do we do that? The standards such as CSA say the existing capacity without the FRP before I do repair should be able to support at least the service load dead plus live, right? The reason for that, I wanna make sure because this is external reinforcement. If anything happened, anybody damaged the FRP by mistake, someone, you know, you're doing renovation, some contractors start cutting through the FRP. I want to make sure the structure will have enough capacity to hold itself. 
right? And they're full live loads. There will be no collapse, no failure, maybe a crack, and so I need to come back and do repair. So this is just like a safety measure just, just to ensure that uh, we don't do excessive strengthening. But that limit, if you compare to this, to the, how much we are allowed to increase based on the, the factors, the, the material factors, the load factors, it's really translate to maybe maximum 40, 50% increase in capacity. So we not we cannot double or triple the capacity of the elements with the composites. It only can add 30, 40, 50% max. It depends on the ratio of dead to live load based on this limit. So this is what we refer to as FRP is only supplemental. It's not primary. Primary means if you lose it, structure may fail. This means it's FRP only supplementing what's the steel that's in there and gets you from the service level to the ultimate factored load uh, that is required by the code. Uh, that is the limitation for the FRP in general. And again, that is only for gravity load. When it comes to seismic, you don't have any limitation. You can, you can, if you can double the capacity, you can do that. Um, so how does this work? Um, if I look in here and I'm, 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 I'm going a little bit technical, but uh, we're not gonna hopefully do this for a long time. If I, you see on this screen is, is to the left is the section, rectangular section, a beam section with a certain width B and certain depth H and has rebar. And that beam section when it goes in bending, it's gonna have a strain deformation in it, right? That strain will translate to stress in the concrete. When we design a reinforced concrete, we translate it to a stress block that has a you know, concrete force in it. And on the bottom, the steel bars will go in tension based on the strain level of strain, assuming fully compatibility um, uh, model and linear strain. I can calculate the stress in the steel. And from that, I calculate the capacity of the element, the simple, model is basically by taking the force, the total force and tension, which is area of steel times the stress in the steel, that's the tension, times the moment arm, which is basically a distance from the centroid of the tension to the centroid of the compression, represented by the symbol, this, this part that you see here between parentheses on the screen. So this is the bending capacity. So what happened if I add carbon fiber, is that when the same section goes into bending, I get strain and tension, and that translates to stress and, and force in the fiber. And that force basically is an additional tension reinforcement that is added to the section that add capacity to it, right? So for me to determine the contribution of the FRP, I need to do more detailed um, uh, uh, strain compatibility force equilibrium calculations. It's not as simple as just plugging in the, the FRP. I need to know what's exactly strain level in the FRP. And this is something we don't typically do for reinforced concrete. And the reason for that we don't do it because most of the time in concrete we design for yielding. So we most of the time plug in the yield strength of the steel bar because that's where we, we, we design ultimately for. While within the same region I designed for, for steel, if I look at carbon, it's basically the stress in the carbon will depend on the strain. So for me to figure out what is the stress, I have to figure out what is the strain in the, in the elements. And because of that, and just like we do reinforced concrete design, there is over reinforced section, under reinforced section as referred to them, where it's, you know, can, can be controlled by compression failure or tension failure. There are all different failure modes that I have to account for in the design. And all these design modes need to be accounted for, right? So for example, if I have an element and I add too much carbon fiber, just like if I add too much steel, it becomes less, less flexible and it doesn't give me warning signs. And that's something we don't like because it makes the element more brittle. Um, CSI standard, it's required that the engineer evaluate that and figure out the change in the ductility of the elements um, and, and maybe and account for it. But unfortunately, CSA does not provide guidance for how to do that. But ACI, on the other hand, has an approach to account for that that we, you know, engineers have been using, which is basically accounting for some type of a reduction um, in the strength depend on where you are in terms of the strain and the steel reinforcement. So if I exceed strain in the steel of 0 0.005, it's become, you know, a little bit more flexible more ductile, less than 0 0.002, it's more brittle. And I can change my design factor and, and capacity calculation based on that. 
Again, I don't want to get too technical into this at this stage, but please, at the end, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I can elaborate further if you're interested. Another thing to, to know is that if I, and what you will see at the screen here is imagine if I take a beam and I test it in flexure. So I get a beam, I put a load on it, and it will go linear elastic at some point. And then after a while, the steel will yielding, it will really start you know, deflecting, deflecting, because the steel keep yielding, yielding. And at some point, ultimately, the concrete will crush in compression and the whole thing will collapse. So this is original reinforced concrete beam in bending test, for example, moment diagram, not moment, moment deflection diagram. If I add FRP to that element, I'm going to, as soon as start yielding, the FRP will pick up and I can increase the strength. Right? You can see I'm reducing the ductility a little bit. And that's why you know, there's a mention of you have to evaluate ductility. If it's critical for you, if it's not critical, maybe you don't have to worry about it. But if I add FRP and I keep adding FRP, I can see I can increase the strength, one layer, two layer, or two ply, three. But then at some point I find if I go four, five, six, I hit the plateau in here. I'm not really exceeding the strength no matter what I do. So what's going on? At this point, if you keep adding tension reinforcement in bending, at some point, you cannot increase the capacity because what's happening is that interface between the FRP and the concrete has reached its limit. So it starts shearing off, shearing off, and that is the debonding failure mode that you cannot really, doesn't matter how much more FRP, doesn't matter. You concrete at your surface reach its limits. And that limit is basically uh, a design criteria that, that a design limit that we, we account for in the design. Here you can see this is one of these failure points. You can see the nice thing about this photo, although it's showing failure, is that we, we, we ripped the concrete of the beam. So the, the failure is not really as people would imagine it or someone would imagine it. It's really at the surface of the bond of the FRP. The, the epoxy is actually stronger than the concrete. The epoxy, higher tension, higher compressive strength. It's the concrete itself at some point will give in and basically shear off at the, at, at the weak link, in this case, at the rebar cage. So the standards give me the design criteria that tell me what is the maximum strain I can achieve in the FRP to prevent that failure mode. So it's not something we don't know, we know, and we design for it. And that design limit, there's a criteria in the, in the uh, CSA, in the S806 document. And there's also a criteria for the FRP bars. And the FRP bar is simple. They tell you, you know, simply you cannot exceed a strain limit of 0 0.007, which means my design force or stress is 0 0.007 strain times the modulus of elasticity of the, of the product. That would tell me that's maximum tension I can use for the design. And for the fabric is gonna depend on the concrete strength because we saw it's a failure in the concrete and also depend on the number of layers, the stiffness, the thickness, because the more I put, the lower this number going to be sometime, right? Will reduce. So that's what's gonna happen. Take this, this strain, multiply it by the modulus that did give me the maximum stress I use in the design. Other thing for flexure is, this, is the detailing. This FRP is need to be detailed similar to new reinforcement that if I have a small deficiency, right? In the section, it doesn't mean I just put small strip just to cover that deficiency. Most of the standards, Canadian and American standards tell you no. You have to extend the FRP enough to go beyond the uh, uh, stress zone or beyond the tension zone. So if you're at the top side in bending, you know, you have to go beyond the inflection points to make sure that, you know, you, you're anchoring in a compression zone. Same thing for the bottom uh, or positive bending. Even though deficiency could be in a small zone at mid-span, I still need to put the FRP over most of the length and make sure it's extended beyond the inflection point for the, for the element, which is typically for reinforced concrete, so roughly 0 0.15 to 0 you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.15 um, of, the, uh, of the span in each direction. So that is to ensure that I'm not gonna get the bonding. Let me give you a case studies. And I was going to put one of the projects in, in Canada, but couldn't get it together uh, on time, unfortunately. So I'm gonna show you a case studies uh, for projects that was done, um, we've done it a few years ago in, in Kuwait. This is a stadium um, in, in Kuwait. And I picked this one because they had a good photos that describe the steps that I mentioned to you. 
Uh, nothing really um, um, uh, other than that. Um, so this is a project that has some issue in it. Th this is the stadium. They build it. Um, just immediately before they open it, they start noticing lots of cracks happening in different locations. Some of these cracks, you can see there are shear cracks at these corbel supports where beam sits on top of beams. And, and some of them, they already start falling apart. Uh, part of this reason, you can tell it's really, uh, they did not put enough material in here to allow for the movement. So the joint material was not really uh, um, uh, enough to allow for the movement due to the, the temperature. You know, Kuwait and some of the uh, co uh, countries in the, in the Gulf region, um, there's a, um, a different, a lot of variation in temperature between day and night, right? And between seasons. And that's because a lot of movement and that movement, if you don't release it, will create very high forces. And you can see it's already start from moving back and forth, falling apart after some time. Um, the general contractor on site tried to fix some of these things by coming up with steel brackets and other solutions uh, with steel beams. <laughs> Not all of them very attractive, but at least they gave it a shot to, to come up with a way to address these things, but that was not enough. The issue was that many of these beams on top of these issues, uh, they had flexural and shear deficiencies. And really the, this, the, the, uh, the stadium was in very good condition, except for the structure itself, the structural component, were having some deficiency that need to be addressed. So it's not like, you know, you can abandon this, uh, this, this structure. Um, you can see some of the raker beams. We also noticed some shear cracks on some of these raker beams uh, at that time. Here, maybe it's a little bit hard to see, I know because you're looking at a screen that's going through another screen, but there are, you can see maybe this faint line, these are all flexural cracks. This is the midspan at the beams. You can see some cracks and there are also some shear cracks on the side of these beams. So they have flexural deficiency and shear deficiency on them. Here, maybe it's easier to see on the photo to the left, the shear crack, 45 degree, a standard shear crack. Have to, we're trying to, to measure the crack width. You can see it in here. And you can see a three millimeter is really getting becoming really large cracks. That tells you that the stress uh, is, is high and the steel is getting close to yielding if it's not yielded in some location. Um, so at that point, the you know, consultant worked on the uh, modeling of the, um, of the different stadium, the different area around the stadium, the slabs to figure out where the steel is adequate, where there's some deficiency. Um, they use 1.1 dead 0.75 live as a limit. That's a limit from ACI for this project. The ACI was the standard versus Canadian use one dead plus one live to verify the existing condition. And, and based on that, the FRP was designed and depend, you know, you can see the nice thing, you can tailor the design. So the, all these area of slab, all these beams, there are only certain areas were defined, found to be deficient and certain beams are found to be deficient. So you can target these with the solution and put the strengthening on the underside or you know, wrap them with shear as needed. Here you can see um, from the structural drawings for the project, layers applied on the bottom side for flexure and then wrapped with sheets to create shear reinforcement. In some cases, a full span, some cases it's partial span that was added. And this is a cross section of the beam showing the beam and the slab, right? You can see at the bottom, there's FRP on the bottom and here is a shear reinforcement, uh, which is what we call a U-wrap versus uh, uh, horizontal uh, uh, longitudinal strips for flexure. This beam, for example, only needed shear deficiency. It had no flexural deficiency. So this is the nice thing you can, you know, tailor it quickly. It's not like you have to order different type of steels and deal with that. You can just on site cut different amount and install them as needed in different orientation. Here you can see this is basically a crew that was sent from uh, um, a leadership crew. All came from the uh, uh, U.S. basically utilizing lo local labor and some you know, labor from the US that went there, the leadership to do this work. You can see here the FRP applied to the surface. Uh, challenging part was the temperature. And I wanted this to mention, this is one of the things is that you know, uh, significantly hot weather during the day, and then it's, cold, it's really cooled down at the evening. And the nice thing you know, with epoxy, it cures quickly, right? When it's a higher temperature, it starts curing faster. In reality, actually within 24 hours, you can achieve full cure of the epoxy. But the challenge is when temperature is too high, 
and you mix the epoxy because the temperature tries to cure it faster, start to become too thick within you know short period of time. So rather than let's say an, a two hour window to work with the epoxy because it's hardened drops maybe to 30 minutes, 40 minutes, make it very hard to deal with that. So because of that the material in this case was kept in a cool place, some of it even in a, in a big fridge, the epoxy, then they mix it and take it and install it or do most of the installation at night. So these things need to be considered. It's not as, a con as much concern in Canada because the temperature is never, never that high and, and we don't have issues there. Uh, but in some areas, when we go, for example, US South, Arizona, Florida, Texas, this becomes sometimes a concern that we have to address. Uh, here you can see all the marking, grinding of the concrete surface. You can see the roughening of the surface. This is a case you can see, this is surface profile three, this is five. This is just to show that in some areas, workers weren't too aggressive. So we're told, no, you can back off. You don't need to go that aggressive. And these chips that come from the International Concrete Repair Institute can use really provide good guide for the verifying the surface. And, and this is what I wanted to show you. I remember I mentioned earlier that the concrete may look good, but once you grind it or remove the outer layer, you can see all the micro cracks. And this is what you actually see while you, all of these things did not show before you remove the concrete. So now you have to really prep this thing, prime it, fill everything with thick epoxy, help glue it together and fill all these voids. You can see it in here, everything is filled, big ones are targeted with epoxy. And then after that, you bring in saturated fabric and install it on the underside of the slab. And then here you can see their fabric on the bottom. And then after that, apply the U-wrap to the, to the concrete. Uh, important things to do during surface prep, there's a quality control that you verify the surface, but also there's a bond test that's done to verify the bond strength of the FRP to the concrete substrate. Um, typically, typical QC require the temperature, the which lot number used where it was installed, the pull tension, the, the pull uh, strength. There's a minimum 1.4 MPA required as bond by the standards. Canadian standards to ensure that the FRP is, is fully bonded. So that is the minimum. And typically most of the time, if the concrete is good, you can easily achieve three uh, or even sometime more than three uh, MPA uh, in bond, bond strength. Uh, this is after it was coated and finished. Uh, most of the time, most of location, this is the beam you can see in here. This is the slab. So this is what I mentioned. When you apply the coating, you can really fully protect it and it's really not that visible. Um, another thing that was done, we're talking about strengthening that some of these locations where they were, you know, sliding, there was very hard to come up with a solution other than installing new columns that went all the way down with a new foundation and a big bearing place, neoprene, that allow it to move, take the movement without, you know, and providing vertical support, additional support to these beams, and that would relieve some of the stress that was going on these joints, um, on these uh, core balls, let's call them. Um, um, and there are a couple of cases where basically it was very hard to install new column because it would be right in the middle of uh, a driveway. So because of that, there was a massive corbel one installed. So this column is actually enlarged. The, the original column is right in the middle and there's a big jacket around it with a corbel that we designed and use that to really take the load back to the existing column um, and, and then account for all the additional bending resulting from that with additional steel that extended all the way down. So this is telling you that most of the time when we do these strengthening project, it's not only composites, it's composites plus enlargement plus steel. It's very, um, very normal for engineers to use their imaginations to come up with the right solutions. Here I wanted to show you, this is actually a chimney, which is a big vertical cantilever going in bending uh, due to seismic uh, code requirements, it was, has a flexural deficiency in bending, right? So then FRP was installed externally uh, in the location where it has uh, doesn't have adequate flexural capacity based on demand provided based on you know by analysis, and that FRP was tailored from three layers to sometimes two layers, some areas to uh, one layers or no FRP. So you can easily change that, and and was applied to uh, to to meet the uh, the standard. And of course, you know as engineers, we always have to use your basic knowledge of mechanics of material or equilibrium. In this case, you have a chimney and it's moved back and forth. The stress level will vary depending on the location. And you just come up with a way to calculate those and integrate. So it's a look like complex equation, but simply saying just we're adding up the sum 
of the of the components of the stress and each of them to figure out the total increase in bending capacity in bending. Um, quickly, I'm going to touch now, just I covered the big picture for the FRP, just how the application for shear and for columns in the next uh, few minutes. Um, so for, for shear, I mentioned the, what we called a U-wrap, which is basically wrapping around the stem of the beam or the joist. And the objective of doing that is basically when, when you have 45 degree shear cracks, you know, these cracks try to open up. And the way we deal with them in concrete is we put vertical stirrups inside the concrete. So these stirrups will stitch the element together and transfer the load between the two sides across the crack, right? That's what will prevent it from failure. This is a simple way. There's, of course, a more complex stress action happening in the elements, but we don't need really to get into that. Um, so these are mimicking internal stirrups, but they are externally applied FRP strips, can be strips or can be continuous, depend on the level of deficiency that you have within the elements. And the FRP can also can be applied as a U-wrap, as what we refer to as an L-wrap or two-sided wrap, right? Now, you can imagine that, you know, this one, the two-sided wrap and the L-wrap provide less strength contribution than the U-wrap. Um, so this is much more efficient versus this one that you have to subtract development length on both ends. And this one that provide you have the uh, contribution, which is only feasible, the L-wrap to thin element. If, I, if you can imagine if I have a wide beam, having reinforcement on one side doesn't make sense. You need something that is makes everything uniformly uh, accounted for. Uh, otherwise, you end up with one side, the cracks too large than the other side. Contribution wise, you know, we know that the, the resistance of in shear is a function of resistance provided by concrete and component by internal steel. And with FRP, we simply add a third component, which is the FRP to, to this thing. One thing I wanted to mention here, I think in my mind is a glitch currently in the S806, is that it says that the, um, the depth of the FRP used for analysis equal to the effective shear depth for internal steel equivalent 2.9, D.72, H, et cetera. But that is in my mind, not correct at all. And the reason for that is that the FRP, if you think about it, is wrapped around the element, st start below the slab. So it doesn't extend to the top of the slab or, or uh, that comes into the element, similar to stirrups. Because of that, I think that depth is, is need to be adjusted. Let me show you in here. I think I have, sorry, I'll come back to it. Uh, before we get there, I wanna mention that, okay, so truss action, we know that the steel contribution, we have an equation for it um, and the Canadian standards, and we have a contribution for the concrete. We know how to calculate that. The issue is for the steel, and I mentioned is the effective depth, uh, sorry, for the FRP. So for the FRP, there is an equation, Right, and that's equation. Uh, maybe let me go to. I, I'm going to take out this and simplify. We can simplify this equation to something much, much simpler, which is basically similar to steel. It's the area of the reinforcement and the modulus times the strain that's equal to the stress and the stress and the reinforcement times the depth divided by the spacing. So similar to steel stirrups, where we calculate the capacity. The glitch in my mind is this DV is not correct. In, in the American standard, the DV or the depth of the FRP divided, specified as the depth below the slab. So I just want you, for those of you who are design FRP, keep that in mind. Consider always not the full depth of the member, but subtract the depth of the slab from your calculation. That is the true depth of the, uh, of the FRP. Okay, and then the standards will tell me exactly what type of strain, strain times stress, that's a force, how to calculate that. There is a guidance. Again, we don't have to dig deeper into too technical. We have a short time in here, but there is a process in which you can calculate that strain that's allowed by the standard for design for the FRP. And that strain you multiply by, um, by the, the modulus. And once you multiply it by the modulus, will give you the stress or the, for the stress in the FRP and then just plug it into this equation to find the shear contribution. Just keep in mind that the depth should be the depth of the FRP, not the entire member. And here's something I wanted to show you why I thought that is critical. The ACI, for example, the American standards account for the thickness of the slab while currently the CSA does, does not clearly say that. And if you miss that and you take, let's say a simple beam 
with the different thickness of the slab, you can see that you know the contribution as you increase the thickness of the slab, you reduce the depth of your effective FIP reinforcement, so the capacity will drop. If you don't pay attention to that and you don't use that when you use the CSA, the capacity would not drop as much, and you can be twice as much as your true contribution from the FRP. This is only the FRP contribution I'm adding in here. So just wanted to make sure visually it's clear to everyone why it's important not to include the slab depth. Other thing is that you know this reinforcement for, for shear can be anchored. It can be anchored with FRP bar or with this anchors that I showed you at the beginning, the fiber anchor where you drill in and splay the FRP. And if you do that, then you can utilize higher contribution from the FRP um, based on the current standards. And the last thing to keep in mind is also, um, maybe not the last, but one of the things is that the spacing is also an issue that we need to consider. I cannot put the FRP strips too far apart because a shear crack can happen right in between them and they won't be effective. That's why I need to keep them close enough to make sure I capture any shear crack. And there is some criteria for that, such as you know, do not exceed one quarter of the, the effective depth or 300 millimeter max. This will guarantee me that we'll always have at least two or three strips that will cross any the crack. Other thing is rounding corner is very important because I want to prevent stress concentration. Uh, currently, there is not clearly indicated in the S806 what is the requirement for beams, but ACI, for example, specify minimum radius of 12 uh, millimeter required. We, we use that for all projects um, in, in Canada and in the US. Um, and the other thing is for columns, if you're doing columns, Let's say sometimes you, you increase the shear, shear strength of columns. So you're up column to increase shear capacity. The corner for columns need to be rounded to close to 20 millimeter in radius. Again, the idea is I'm trying to prevent stress concentration that can create or can lead at some point to premature failure at higher stress level. So these are detailing. It's not really um, 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 a design requirement, but detailing requirement to ensure the design intent is achieved. And this can be easily done with the grinder most of the time. They grind it off to create that radius. And sometimes if a column, for example, or beam has a chamfer, big chamfer on it, you can rebuild it with thick epoxy trowel that has radius and you build that corner, create that radius. Um, this is a parking garage. Parking garage was going into a significant corrosion, mainly because of the icing salts they kept using on the top side, coming in, infiltrating into the, the elements and restrained for movement, like I mentioned to you. The combination of the two caused some of these corbels actually to corrode to a level that there was a collapse in the parking garage. So once that happened, uh, the authority came up with a program to rehabilitate this parking garage, do and come up with a solution, including fixing all the corroded uh, concretes, injecting all the cracks, wrapping with FRP, adding shear capacity based on some assumptions. So here you can see adding the shear capacity uh, for the elements, um, wrapping it with, with FRP. So you can see the end after they're wrapped with FRP and coated for protection, long-term protection. And also the column corbels here, you can see this one actually after it was repaired and injected with epoxy, the FRP been tailored around it with proper overlap to ensure continuity. And then once it's wrapped completely, the, now the nice thing about uh, composite is they're watertight. So when you wrap it, not only provide confining force that add capacity, but also they're sealing the surface to some degree. So water is it's not gonna get into uh, from the side at least. So as long as the water, the top side, the water, is waterproofing is done correctly, there's no water coming in through the joints, then the structure element will have additional or extended uh, protection against corrosion. And shimil, similar to shear and, and beams, there are shear walls. Shear walls can also, especially lateral resisting systems, you know, become an issue in earthquake and, and, and maybe less severe in wind, but you still have to address uh, these issues. I can use FRP as horizontal reinforcement. I can design them to take that additional shear force to breathe me shear strength. So this is an example. This is one wall that with FRP. And here's another wall with FRP, of course, different amount depend on the level of deficiency. And the idea is I mimic internal steel with externally bonded FRP to add that uh, shear capacity that I need. 
In some cases, what I show you in here to the left, this is an elevation of a wall. I can also put FRP and then anchor it in between the slab with FRP bars or some of these bundles or these FRP bars to provide some bending capacity if it's needed for these elements. And again, I can splice this with, with uh, FRP bars through the slabs to create continuity. So there are many ways that we can use these systems to add capacity. This is an example I showed you at the beginning where you can see the shear strength is added in two walls. This is less deficient. You can see less strips versus this one and vertical strips to account for bending deficiency in one or two of these uh, levels in some of these walls. And this was in this case, lateral system intended for wind versus the first one I showed you was uh, uh, seismic. And then finally, confinement. We're going to go this uh, quickly because I think everybody got the, the idea of the uh, FRP application. I mentioned you can wrap columns to add axial capacity, shear capacity, and ductility, which is very important in seismic regions, right? It's confining of that plastic hinge, allow the structure to move and dissipate energy is really very important when it comes to seismic uh, existence of elements. The way it works in columns is if I, if you imagine, imagine you have a column and you apply vertical load to it, that column is gonna try to shorten vertically and expand laterally. And as it's try to expand laterally, there is a lateral stress strain, right? That causes the concrete to crack, right? And then we sometimes get spalling. And because of that, I lose some of the section. And with the movement back and forth, I can get degradation or start vertical crack develop and their axial load, increasing axial load until rebar may buckle and the whole thing may, the column or element may burst, right? Now I can, by confining this element, FRP or steel, I can hold it together. And by holding it together, I preventing the, mic, the internal cracking from becoming too massive. And by doing that, I'm holding the concrete so it can take more vertical load. It would not buckle as bits and pieces coming off from it and fail. So that's really the confinement effect. It can increase the axial capacity by applying lateral pressure to the, to the element. So this is the concept we've been using with steel jacketing for many years. It's not new at all. We're just trying to mimic the same behavior with externally applied carbon fiber. Give you an example. This is just as simple as, I'm showing you this because it's a simple thing that we did in our lab actually, to show you the, the behavior of FRP. This is a concrete cylinder, standard cylinder, um, with, wrapped with, with FRP with different layers, one layer, two layers, three layers. So you can see here, I'm gonna show you the curve. I got the first cylinder and I, I apologize, the force was in, in, in pound force, um, not in, in, um, in kips or any uh, okilonewton. Um, but you can see the scale wise, I can see here the cylinder. Now I add, this is one layer. You can see one layer, how much I almost tripled the load with one layer. But again, this is one layer, it's a small cylinder. So one layer as a ratio is a lot of reinforcement. So that's why you can see a lot. But the important thing, look at the ductility. Why you see this ductility? Because concrete can crack and lose some stiffness, but it's not gonna fall apart. So I'm not losing part of my section. I go to two layers, I go to, to four layers, you can see significant increase. Now I mentioned to you, the code has a limit. I can only increase it maybe by 40, 50%. So all this nice stuff increase, I'm not gonna be able to, I'm not allowed to use per standards because I, I'm not allowed to, uh, the concrete allow it to crack significantly because it's gonna lose lateral stiffness. So I'm limited by again, this 40, 40% 40 approximately for increasing capacity. Now, if I compare the behavior of a circular, which just looked at with, with square, you can imagine that if the section is not round, I'm not confining uh, efficiently enough. So that is not as efficient increasing the strength. So the strength I see in circular is much less in a square or rectangular shape, especially when I reach a limit of, you know, as aspect ratio of length to width of two or more. But even though I'm not achieving strength, look what I'm getting. I'm getting significant uh, displacement, right? In all the cases, which sometimes all I'm looking for when it comes to seismic for plastic hinge, I want the section to stand. I get, I need more strain of the concrete before it collapse. I wanna increase that 0 0.0035 to 0 0.0055, 0 0.006 if I can, and allow the section to rotate 
without really uh, uh, going through virtual failure. So there is a process for that. Again, we don't have time, we're gonna go through it, but design equations for axial load specifically increase with confinement is not that much different than the current design equation. The only difference is that rather than using concrete strength, when I wrap it, I'm gonna plug in here the confined concrete strength. And again, there is a criteria available in CSA that tells me what is that confinement strength? It depends on the amount of the FRP I use. So if I put more FRP, I get more confinement. I can increase this axial capacity of the concrete. So maybe I start with 28, I put FRP, that number is gonna jump maybe to 35. Then I come back to the concrete column equation and plug here, here a higher strength for the concrete and get higher overall strength of the column including the steel contribution, of course. And then finally, let me show you some, some quick example for this, because sometimes it's hard to imagine how true this is. I mean, I remember 20 years ago when, when we were talking about this technology, um, many engineers say, oh, well, you know, this is a thin material like wallpaper. How can it add capacity? Well, let me show you some of the example, the strength of this material, how can it translate to improve in performance? So this is a test that was done on column under axial load and lateral load to see the performance of the plastic hinge with and without carbon fiber. This is using the carbon fiber, the VRAP system that we typically use in design. So here you can see this is the column to the right without the confinement. What happened after a while, go back and forth a few cycles and then the Concrete starts falling, you lose a cross section effectiveness, and then the rebar starts getting exposed, then you get buckling or crushing, keep moving in, and so on. And this is mimicked by the red line on the chart. Now, once I put carbon fiber, here we have a blue line with a glass fiber and black line, you can see in carbon fiber. You can see how we can ext extend the behavior. You can see there is more ductility, the energy dissipation, the area under this curve, is basically almost the blue and the black, almost three times more than the, the red. So I added more energy dissipation, more ductility to the section. That's allowing me to get more drift on my structure, maybe able to, to, to dissipate without really failing the, the column. So this is really as, as a hinge. Um, I wanna show you also a test in shear, for example. This is previous test being published. Um, uh, by, by others, of course. This is one column we did without FRP, where you do lateral uh, uh, force, and at some point you fail the column in shear. So after that, what we did, we wrapped the column, and you can see here the red, you know, we, we know that shear is a brittle failure, and you can see here it failed a brittle way, a few cycles and failed, but once we wrapped it and added shear capacity to it, we are able to change a failure mode and now we went into steel yielding and you can see now we get more ductility because we change the failure mode from a brittle, brittle to more ductile failure, uh, failure mode. And then this is uh, finally one call, I keep saying finally, but this is hopefully really truly finally, um, uh, a column that's been strengthened with FRP. Um, it's almost five and a half meters high, so it's relatively high. So one thing to keep in mind that we always have to check for is I want to make sure I'm not adding capacity, extra capacity, and forget that there's a buckling limit for these columns, right? So this column, for example, it's only supporting one mezzanine level. It's not like continue multiple levels. So it was okay. It needed to increase like 15, 20% was done with FRP and the buckling was adequate. There was other, the same building and other location, a column that continues a few levels up for that height, when you design it with FRP, you are not adding stiffness, right? You're not adding mass to it. So the buckling load is not changing because the EI or the, 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 you know, the stiffness of the section, the bending stiffness, EA, let's call it, or EI, um, it's not changing. And because of that, that column, could, we could not do it with FRP and we end up enlarging it with a concrete jacket because we needed to increase the stiffness and the strength, which was not dealing with, with FRP. So my point here is finally is FRP is a good solution, but it's not a magic solution for all the cases. There are many cases in which FRP may not be viable. And you as an engineer or any of you should be able to or, or evaluate that based on all the criteria available in the standards and based on that determine if you 
uh, you can use FRP or other solutions um, are needed. And with that, I think I conclude my presentation. I hope it was a, a good balance of practical application, things to think about, and actual cases, plus some equations, not too much of any for you. Thank you, Dr. Arkhadraji. This was a very comprehensive and very compact, full of information, and I enjoyed it very much. I learned from it very much. I'm sure my colleagues have also learned and maybe they have some questions to ask. Do you want a, a couple of minutes to refresh or we can go ahead with questions? No, I think we're good. Let's uh, go ahead with questions. All right, uh, please come forward for questions. So let me <clears throat> uh, ask the first question myself. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned about adding capacity to the flexural capacity of the elements and shear capacity of the elements and also compressive capacity of the elements. Right. Uh, I wonder if uh, FRP could be used uh, to add to the torsional capacity of elements. Um, yeah, so I did not, because of the time, I did not mm. dig deeper into that. But there are cases in which, for example, a beams that have one short span and one long span and they're changing the loading end up with torsional demand on them that exceeded the internal reinforcement. Mm. So we were able to, to do that. However, you, I think you know that when it comes to torsional, you need completely closed loop of reinforcement, right? Mm. You cannot have it on three sides. So what we end up doing is basically drilling through the slab and putting in these, these bundles of carbon fiber that I mentioned, right? To close the loop and create a loop all the way run through uh, the slab and then we wrap it on the bottom side with FRP fabric and then put some longitudinal FRP as needed because torsion require both closed loop and longitudinal FRP. So it is possible. It requires some detailing. It's more demanding because you have to drill through the slab and you have to cut grooves on the slab because you, whatever reinforcement go through the slab, you need to hide it. So you cut the groove from the top side and you drill through both sides of the beam so you can hide that bundle of FRP in there. But it is feasible and there's a design approach available for it. It's not in the Canadian standards currently in S806, but there are lots of papers and literature that can be used to you know, understand how this can work. Okay, great. And uh, another question is about foundations. Mm. Have you ever used the FRP for reinforcement of, of uh, foundations or uh, enlarging the foundations or anything like that? Yeah, so foundation is a little bit different because most of the time, if you think about it, um, let's look at just typical <laughs> footing. The bend, the bottom is where intention, right? Where we have the positive reinforcement and you cannot really get to the underside to put a reinforcement uh, or sometimes punching shear, which FRP doesn't help with punching shear. Mm -hmm. What we have done for foundation, typically for strengthening is basically making them you know, either bigger and adding more steel on the sides and also making them deeper if you have enough depth. So you, you roughen the surface, you put some dowels, you add more concrete. And by doing that, you're increasing the effective depth uh, of the foundation for bending and you add more punching shear capacity. So enlargement with concrete is the most common technique that us and others I think been using to strengthen um, uh, foundations. There are some cases in which you know, you may, may be limited by the soil type or the other, you know, limitation space boundary element for the, uh, for the, for the land itself. So you may have to put micro piles and enlarge and, and sit the foundation of micro piles. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Uh, Mr. Azizi, please. Yep. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, my question is a little bit general, and that's um, regarding these FRPs. Uh, when they are making these, or it's not building, it's making the manufacturer, are they uh, being made in different thicknesses? 
This is the first question. Second is if they are different thicknesses or they're coming in the standard thickness, then as a designer, are you preferring to uh, use one thicker or multiple uh, thinner layers? Okay. This is very, uh, very good question. Thank you, Mr. Azizi. Um, so the FRP comes actually in multiple thicknesses. Like, I, uh, for example, there is uh, uh, some of the basic system could be almost half half a millimeter to one millimeter to two millimeters uh, uh, thickness and even even more. Um, so in the past, I tell you when we started working with composites, there was only one thickness, very thin, relatively almost one, almost one or less than one millimeter uh, thickness. Uh, but now it's been 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 increasing. Because now we find out that the cost of labor within multiple layers, it costs more than getting one thick layer and put it up. The material would be the same cost, multiple layers or two layers, but you have more cost of labor, right? So to answer the second part, my preference is to put one thicker layer than multiple thinner layers. From an engineering perspective, it's not gonna change. The, des the design is the same. In the equation when you add multiple thicknesses, Add up to the same number as you add, you know, uh, uh, one thick one. But the cost would be cheaper if I do it thicker, and that would save my client or the, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the cost of the upgrade will help them with that. So that's why we try whenever it's possible to optimize and we use a thicker or stiffer material than multiple layers of the thinner materials. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Questions? Yes, Mr. Ali. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, good presentation. Just wanted to know, uh, is there any uh, research regarding to price and uh, does it work for small projects or it's uh, how much the cost would be if you want to use this method right so carbon fiber uh, is more expensive than steel uh, but it is much easier to install so overall from experience i tell you the cost for installing carbon fiber is cheaper than anything else that's why we most of the time when we work on a project with a client, we try the FRP first, the carbon fiber. If it doesn't work for all these limitations we talked about, then we go to enlargement or steel plates or something else, external post tensioning, um, because it's so easy to handle. You can cut it in, apply it, even though material is a little bit more expensive. And you know, in North America, construction is really not really controlled a lot by the cost of the material, but more by labor. Now things are changing with the supply chain mm -hmm. and materials keep going up and inflation, um, but still it's it's um, uh, significantly driven by labor. Um, I don't see a limit for it, honestly. I've done um, work on a project in which it's only needs a couple, couple of strips for a penetration. And I worked on a project where we did a significant slab with a multiple level strengthening with FRP for diaphragm on the, let's say, on the West Coast in, in, in California, San Francisco, for lateral seismic load. In all these cases, it was the, uh, the, the most economical solution. So now it's really, uh, honestly, I, in my mind, at least based on what I know from this industry, it is a better solution, cheaper solution than other uh, techniques. When it, when it fits the requirements of the standards of the codes of the calculations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Hamati. Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> I want to appreciate uh, Mr. Tarek. It was really, really, uh, informative. My uh, uh, I have a question. In the location, we have a negative moment. You know, can we use RFP on top of like a slab, bridge slab? And in this case, you know, when if the vehicle passing the FRP, is it any you know reduced strength of FRP if it is under traffic load? 
Okay, yeah, I did. Um, um, I talked about this at the beginning, and actually, I don't know if you, if you if you were there, but let me mention quickly. So you can apply FRP on the uh, on the top side. Um, you can see here on the top side. This is, but this is again inside. This was more like a warehouse, so they were going to put epoxy flooring on it. it should not be an issue. Um, if you have it in a location where there's a traffic, then we use sometimes the concept that we call surface mounted bars because the surface mounted bars are placed in a groove. They are grooves that are not on the surface, they are below the surface, right? So they're really in a way protected. That's why this one case I showed in here, um, this parking garage is basically, it's a parking garage and it's really covered in, in, in epoxy. So it's protected from traffic, right? I can show you in here, this is a bridge deck and where they put the FRP bars, not other than the fabric, right? Because the FRP bars are embedded below the surface and they put some coat of asphalt on top of it. I've seen cases in which parking garages we've done and actually the engineer did specify the fabric, not the bars. And on top of that, they, they specified epoxy flooring. And I was involved in a couple of these projects. Um, one of them is, is actually in New York. And they have been working well because there's a traffic epoxy with the sand broadcast they put in it that's very durable. Epoxy works very well with FRP and it's been working fine so far. It's been a few years now. So um, I would say traffic, you have to evaluate that carefully, right? And if needed, you can use surface mounted bars versus fabric. And, or if you wanna use fabric because sometimes it's less intrusive to the surface, then you need to put some kind of protective coating that is resistance to traffic, something that is durable, that's been shown to last very long because some of the traffic coatings may not last more than three to five years. So you need the really high durable epoxy based flooring system. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your answer. And also for the marine structure, can you apply FRP underwater? Uh, you can, and actually it's been done um, on many projects. Um, it's it's not the, the carbon itself, it really doesn't corrode, nothing happened to it. You, you've seen these boats, right? It's made of carbon and glass fiber sitting in water, salty water for 20, 30 years. Um, it's the application process. So there is an epoxy, that is made for underwater. Um, so you saturate it and when you put it, when you get it underwater, it's still cured underwater. And some of it actually get activated. There are some type of epoxies that get activated by water. Um, uh, so there are underwater epoxies that been used to do repairs underwater. Um, however, if you have a section like a pier or column that's significantly uh, deformed, you know, has a lot of spalling uh, from the section, you cannot just wrap it. And there are some cases like this where they basically bring in composite jacket made of glass fiber, you know, like life jackets and other things they call them. You put them in there that has annular space and you inject a grout in there, or some epoxy grout or some matrices grout and rebuild that section. And the jacket itself will provide some protection um, to, the, to the pier. So there are multiple ways to do it. FRP is feasible underwater. Yes, that's the short answer, but it's not always the best the best uh, solution. Okay, thank you. Other questions, <clears throat> Mr. Ali? Do you have uh, another question or? You are done. No, just uh, now you are asking if, uh, because maybe we have time, if it's possible, uh, just asking one more question. Uh, how long this uh, FRP uh, now uh, has been used? Uh, is it for long term or is a very new material? Um, no, it's um, so the, the research on FRP, the testing started in the 70s and no. starting the 80s, um, Japan was using it in the 80s to do seismic upgrade, upgrade and bridge strengthening. And in the US, we start in the 90s and North America as well started in the 90s, US and Canada. Um, so there have been, we have projects that's com been completed 26, 27 years ago, some of the oldest ones. I have one done in 1998 or 99 in a wastewater 
uh, plant, which is basically, it's a very harsh environment on the inside walls. It's been there. I have projects from 2000 and, and, and a couple of airports that every now and then when we fly, we try to look at it. Um, so it's been in service uh, for many, many years now. It's not new technology anymore. That's why, for example, there's this, you have a standard, right? The Canadian standard S806. Mm -hmm. It's basically building official results telling you it's acceptable to use. And, you know, as long as you stick to these rules and design criteria. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Al Khadri. This was uh, a very good uh, gathering and uh, we learned a lot of technical information from you and uh, we will put this recording on our website and a lot of more of us will check that recording later on. Thank you all for participating and have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you so much. Are you, uh, Mr. Tarek, are you attending uh, Concrete Expo this year? Uh, probably, yes. Oh, as a, okay, good, so. Yeah, we may be going to exhibit actually as well. Okay, great, so I will come to you, to your uh, booth. Awesome, great, we'll see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> good night, bye. That's very good, thank you. بله دستم اگه درد نکنه